Hi, and a very warm welcome to today's Knowledge Exchange event. For those of you who have not met before, I'm Jen Quinn, Growth Manager at Virgin Money Manchester. Um, we are delighted to be sponsors of today's event. Our key focus at the moment is to ensure that our customers are supported. Information on the support offered can be found on our website and we'll be sharing that link with you all following today's event. Please feel free to get in touch with me or any of the team if there's anything else that we can help you with. We'd love to hear how you found today's event. Please do tag us in your social media posts. We're at Virgin Money on all social platforms. And today our panel will be discussing the effects of COVID-19 has had on the higher education sector. Chris Peacock, Head of Manchester Grove and Communications will be chairing today's panel. So for now, I'll hand over to Chris and look forward to catching up with you soon. Thanks very much, Jennifer. I really appreciate that. And um, thank you again for Virgin Money's kind support of our Knowledge Exchange webinar series. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I think this is going to be a really interesting discussion. Uh, first of all, sorry for being slightly late. As always, we're living in 2020. Anything can happen. And as usual, sometimes the tech doesn't quite work. But we're there now. We've got a great panel of, of individuals representing higher education across Greater Manchester. And I think given the last week or so um, in regards to A levels, higher education, the challenges that the university sector is facing has really been highlighted, um, not just for the students who had a torrid time last this time last week, but also for the institutions themselves. And I think we're very lucky to have the guests that we've got today to talk about it, looking at, first of all, what that has meant um, to them, um, from last week, but looking at the wider challenges as well that the, that the HE sector is going to be facing going forward. So thank you everyone for joining me. So just very quickly, some quick introductions for everyone who's, who's joined us today. We've got Nalin Thacker, for the Vice President of the University of Manchester. We've got Joe Purvis, the Pro Vice Chancellor for Academic Development from the University of Salford. We've got Craig Gaskell, who's the Principal and CEO of University Academy 92. We've got Jennifer Watling, the Pro Vice Chancellor for International at Manchester Metropolitan University. And finally, we've got Condal Reddy Candy, the Deputy Vice Chancellor from the University of Bolton. Thank you all for joining me today. Um, really appreciate it. Um, and it really means a lot to have all of you here to be able to talk about it. So let's kick off then. Um, really, I don't think there's anywhere else we can start other than what we saw last week with the A-level results and how students were having to deal with this issue and, and how universities were having to deal with this issue. Um, so I was going to start, um, Jennifer, if that's OK with you. What um, what were your perceptions and how, what, how did you deal with last week as everything was unfolding? Um, thanks, Chris, and, and great to be here this morning. Um, I'll just pick you up on one point. It was this week, actually, the announcement that the government made around A-levels. It was on Monday. I think, you know, things, so much is happening at the moment that it does feel like last week, so I can yes. forgive you for that. <laughs> but it's been, it's been a, definitely a roller coaster ride for students, and I think all universities are aware of that. And, uh, you know, we've all um, prepared ourselves ready for confirmation and clearing, which happens every year. So the announcement by the government earlier this week I think, um, you know, while it came as a bit of a surprise, I think we were all fairly quickly able to prepare ourselves to ensure that we could meet the needs of the students. So, you know, every university will be doing its utmost to ensure that we can provide places to students on the courses that they are looking for. It's no small challenge. There's no doubt about that. Um, but I think we are all well placed to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. No, th thank you. To now, Lynn, how's the um, University of Manchester um, dealt with this? Because obviously a, a, a situation where you were getting some students who were ringing up the university saying that they didn't quite have the grades and those who have had to reconsider their options, accepting offers for their second choice, third choice universities. How's it been at uh, University of Manchester? I suppose personally, I would I would say, uh, from a personal point of view, I know the anxiety as a as the father of a child undertaking not G, not A levels but GCSEs about the uncertainty about how the results were going to work out, uh, even if they were in good schools. But um, added to that, the sort of 
big uh, sword waiting over their heads in terms of whether they were going to get into their chosen university. I can only feel really, really sort of sorry for these parents. And we had some very heartbreaking stories sort of relayed to us where people, particularly from um, uh, disadvantaged areas and so on, um, suffering disproportionately in terms of the grade uh, alterations and so on. So I was very glad when the government saw sense, personally, in terms of the only fair way to do this eventually was through um, uh, centre assessed grades. Having said that, we, as Jenny has outlined, went through the full process of confirmation, clearing, where we were told to accept the results as they were. So we did say to the people who didn't meet the grades that you can't come here. Unfortunately, they're too far away from your grades that were, you've been offered, uh, and your conditional offer was, and offered those places to some other students who had actually got the grades through clearing. So we filled the places up, even with that 5% buffer that the government offered us. Mm -hmm. And then the revision has meant that we are going to get uh, a lot more students. And that number is indefinite at the moment because we only found out yesterday afternoon what the centre assessed grades were. So um, it has put us in a very difficult position. We mustn't underestimate that because the courses were already 5% uh, plus what we would normally take. And there are certain limits on um, particular courses where there is, a, you know, like medicine, dentistry and so on, which might not affect the uh, other universities. But for us, that that is a critical issue. But it might do in nursing, for example, and so on for other universities where you really pushed in terms of how many you can accommodate. Mm -hmm. uh, government lifted its um, uh, limits on medical students yesterday, medical dental students yesterday, but the numbers are huge, <laughs> you know, from first estimate. Now, we don't know how many of those who, uh, for whom we were second choice and who accept, who didn't get meet their first choice and came to us, mm -hmm. are now going to say, we're not coming to you <laughs> and we're yeah. going to try and get into the first choice. So there is a there is quite a bit of chaos at the moment, but our staff are working all out to, to try and sort of sort this out so that we can remove that uncertainty for people. And, you know, we, we have to think about things like deferral because the other key issue is here that we are in still in the time of the pandemic mm -hmm. and Manchester has particularly got a worsening situation, not an improving situation. GM has got a worsening situation. And we have to do social distancing. So how do you maintain optimal social distancing with the increased numbers? Yeah. So there is an additional uh, problem for uh, all the universities, which which uh, uh, I think is is a major headache for us at the moment. No, absolutely. Um, I, I want to come on to a couple of things that you've picked up there, about looking at how a, how what is going what is going to university going to look like um, in September, which lest we forget, is only a few days away actually now. Um, but Joe, I'm just coming to you actually on that. I'm just thinking about the the challenge for staff that they're having to face at the moment. I remember when I worked at a university uh, many years ago, um, we all chipped in to help when it was clearing. Every member of university staff kind of takes a couple of days when they drop tools or whatever they were doing because they had to help with clearing. I can only imagine what this last few days have been like working in universities and whether it is academic staff or support staff or ground maintenance even having to help pick up phones to help people and and help the students what's it been like at Salford well um you're right everybody pitches in at this time of year and and this year's been no different um in that sense in terms of the willingness of staff to pitch in what we've had to do is um, our clearing lines haven't been where they've normally been. So we had a whole IT um, development that needed to take place to allow uh, people to come in for clearing, but be socially distanced and have the right technology because there's quite a sophisticated set of telephone telecoms technology behind 
the whole system of clearing. So um, for our staff, the most important thing for us was to make sure that they felt safe coming onto campus. We decided we didn't want to go down the route of having staff do clearing at home because they don't have the, the support as a group. Um, and it's, it's one of those things where you need to be able to shout across the room to somebody and say, I need advice on such and such. Um, so it was then we had to make sure that every member of staff had a proper induction, could ask the questions that they wanted to about how to come back onto campus, that we knew how they were getting in. And for us, actually, it's been a good dry run for welcoming the staff in general back onto the campus um, mm. for the start of term. And we will start moving back on from the start of September. Term doesn't start until the end of September. So um, we will be practicing moving around the campus and trying to spot any bottlenecks that occur um, or that might occur or because there are a lot of one way systems in place. Mm -hmm. There's lots of hand sanitizer. Um, there will be different arrangements of catering. So um, clearing gave us the, the opportunity to do that. Um, just to pick up on a couple of Nalin's points, um, we are we do have the same issues as uh, Manchester for for us for nursing, um, because not only have we are we now theoretically full for September, we are also full for January. So we're now having to look out because results properly came out yesterday. We're now having to revise all of that and see what we can do to expand. And actually, a lot of this will depend on our relationship with the NHS and the government's uh, support for the NHS so that we have placements for these students, because mm. it's not just about us teaching them on campus. It's putting them into the hospitals as well, and that will be a big increase. One really positive thing I see around this um, is that actually in the time of COVID, we universities were very uncertain at the start of the pandemic whether students would want to come to university at all and actually we have seen huge demand um, and we expect this to go on and I think it, it proves that the value that people put in a university education and also looking forward to what might happen in the economy the fact that they think going to university is going to be something that will give them a head start in what may well be a difficult um, job market when they graduate. Oh, thank you, Jenna. No, absolutely. Um, certainly, I think it'd be interesting to hear what people's views around placements and how what's going to happen this year and going forward around those opportunities for people to get that work experience as part of their education and high, uh, part of higher education. Um, Craig, if I can come I come to you next, um, correct, correct, please correct me if I'm wrong, but of probably the youngest of the institutions in Greater Manchester for, for higher education with UA92. Um, what has been your experience of the last couple of weeks and in terms of how it's affecting yourself or how you, how you think it might be affecting students coming to you? Yes, yeah, we, well, we, we are. We're in a very interesting position that we are very new as an institution. So we'll just be going into our second ever academic year uh, at University Academy 92 next next year. So uh, so we're dealing in the hundreds of students rather than the thousands like some of the other institutions, but, uh, but obviously growing. Uh, I'd echo uh, a lot of what Joe said. I think uh, the encouraging thing is to hear from so many students that just want to move on. And I think that's the overlying message from my perspective is we all have to do whatever we can to facilitate uh, uh, these uh, many young people, people of all ages actually studying in higher education uh, to facilitate them the them moving on at this time. A lot, of, a lot of young people have been quite constrained and very well behaved from from uh, uh, from what I can see. So it's really, really important we now facilitate that. Uh, so so I'd echo what Joe said. Um, uh, we, we did exactly the same and uh, decided to use the clearing process to actually open up our socially distanced campus, test whether we've got the hand sanitizers in the right place, test the one way systems when it's just been staff. And we went a step further last Saturday and actually started uh, inviting uh, family, small family groups. You can't do big open days 
in the way that we've always done them. So we had to cancel all of our applicant days. We've got this lovely brand spanking new campus, but we right at the point that we were going to invite all the applicants to come on and have a look around at that point for the first time, uh, we went into lockdown. Uh, so, so I think the um, what I've experienced more than in, in the past in clearing is much more communication from parents and relatives. So a lot of our staff have been talking to talking to the, the, the students, of course, uh, but parents and relatives, particularly asking questions around Manchester and how Manchester as a place for those from outside the area is working. So we thought it was quite important to enable small family groups in social distance groups to actually come onto campus. And that's an ongoing thing now. So quite exciting for me, really, from Saturday, last Saturday, was to actually see some of our student ambassadors come back to start to talk to them about their experiences directly in lockdown. And just as Joe said, they're so excited to just get on with it and, and uh, uh, remake connections where they've got work placements because that's part of our model. So I think a real sense of excitement, uh, but also a sense of kind of the first time out for a, a lot of people so things around accommodation well-being and support so we've really had to scale up that end of it uh, but for me so our experience is slightly different as a growing institution uh, but i would echo it's the same amount of enthusiasm and just they just want to get on with it now and we're going to do everything we can to facilitate that and, and get rid of any sense of uncertainty we've been very clear how we're operating what we're doing and we're getting on with it yeah. No, thank you, Craig. Uh, Colin, if I can finally come to you for this, the starting point. Um, I, I wanted to ask you particularly, I mean, we picked up then about the, the importance of, of higher education. Um, we've talked about it with the students, but I was also thinking about it for the wider communities and, and certainly for um, an establishment like the University of Bolton, um, where the university is, is a fundamental part of the town centre and particularly for somewhere like Bolton, it's a fundamental part of the regeneration of the town centre. Um, a disclaimer, I'm very proudly from Bolton and <laughs> so I've got a slight bias in terms of that, of how wonderful the town is. Um, but just just in regards to that, Condor, um, how, how have you seen the last few days affecting your institution and, and what your thoughts are in terms of the positioning of the university for the town? Um, you're definitely from the right place, Chris. Um, <laughs> um, just to just to echo what uh, Craig, Joe, and uh, Nalin and uh, everybody has said, it's really important that universities open up for students and communities in September. It's so important, and that's why um, even around May, we were the first university to decide to open the campus in September, and that <laughs> attracted huge media attention for good reasons because um, we are a campus-based university and most of our learning happens on campus, whether it's practical training in nursing, special effects, computing. So students coming onto campus is so important for them and also the communities and regeneration. Um, we needed to work very hard to keep our promise to open the campus on September 14th. So what we have done to prepare, to give that sense of confidence for the students to come back to campus, we took a comprehensive range of measures so if you come to our campus, you will see the airport style um, uh, thermal scanners so that students can say, you know, if they, if they pick up high temperature, uh, we could recommend them to go for testing and things like that. So not only they are safe, the campuses, but also students should feel safe in those environments. Of course, the hygiene, um, social distancing, one way traffic, one way walking systems, all of those. So we haven't had much of the holiday over the summer in that sense. Um, so <laughs> been working extremely hard to keep up the promise, not only to create safe environment, but students to feel safe when they come and look at the campus. Mm -hmm. um, just to also uh, to let you know how keen the students are to come to campus and also the local communities. We did a quick survey of our current students, second and third years who are going to come in September. Uh, around 1000 responses, over 80% of the students want to come back to campus and that's how keen the students are. And that's why I'm really glad that most of the universities are opening up the campuses for the communities, for the students to come back and get the deserved learning experience. Because, you know, the last year is the last, could be a last generation again, you know, so it's really important. So coming back to the communities aspect, communities involve both people and the businesses, of course. And for businesses developing the skills, I'm sure that's the next question, um, the skill set, um, because what could bring us all out of this real big uh, challenge 
is the skills and knowledge. That's the only thing that could bring us out, whether it's you know new courses in computing, creative technologies, health, engineering, uh, advanced manufacturing. We need to make sure we are developing the skill set and preparing the young people to go and work in local communities, businesses and regional businesses. So in that sense, I, I believe it's central. If there's something to be open first, it has to be universities, of course, in a safe environment. Um, so it's that critical and the students want to come back and the communities where we are in touch with uh, the Bolton Council, our local NHS trust and the preparing as best as we can. Just final one point to pick on what Nalin has said in terms of the chaos that was created um, uh, last week and this week in terms of turnaround. What we also said on, on that particular aspect of A-levels, we said a triple lock guarantee. Uh, even before government went to turn around, what we said is, you know, whatever the best score, whether the score you had uh, or whether the score your teacher submitted to that, we will accept the best score. We said that before government did the turnaround and that really helped our students to come out of that distress and actually have the confidence that they can go to the University of Bolton and or some of the university and study the courses they want. You're absolutely right, and Joe was right. The places are limited um, in terms of nursing, uh, in terms of special effects, computer gaming. These are very high demand courses at Bolton. What we have done is try to expand those places, um, working with our NHS trust partners so that students are not disappointed. They are going to join the courses they want and the, the, the get the learning they deserve. So that's a kind of broad based thing that's going on at Bolton. Very busy indeed, but no. for good reasons. That's brilliant. Thanks, Condal. I know that um, everyone watching at the moment, you can only see the one person that's speaking, but throughout that, where everyone spoke, the number of nodding heads from everyone taking part, <laughs> not just with Condal, but as everyone spoke, it's great to see such unity and everyone in agreement of what's happening and, and what all our institutions are up to. Um, before I go into some more questions, um, just to remind everyone who is watching, if you do have any questions, please submit them through the Q&A function that we have. We will do our best towards the end um, to ask any questions you may have. If there are any questions that we can't answer, we'll obviously we'll take those away and, and try and get back to you separately. But please do, if you've got any questions, please submit them and we'll be happy to try and answer them. Uh, so just picking up then from what Condor was saying, there's lots of things from all of you have, have spoken about there. I think and you've, each of you I think have touched on it to, to a certain degree, is what is the student experience going to look like in September? I mean, Condor was describing there those airport scanners as you walk in, and I found it really interesting that that survey where students want to come in. I think there's been lots of talk about how universities were going to be holding lots of courses online and they wouldn't be expecting students to come in, um, but certainly by the sounds of it, students want to be on campuses want to be coming into place. So so what is if, if I was going to be starting in September, start with you now at the University of Manchester, what would my experience look like for students come September? Well, we, we are offering a blended uh, offering so that some lectures certainly will be online because there's no way you could fit 400 or 500 medical students mm -hmm. with social distancing in, in a, any venue that we have, um, you would be looking at something like Albert Hall or something if you want. I was going to say, we could always borrow Old Trafford when they're not playing now. Or so <laughs> yes, of yeah, course, you can do that, um, but not very practical. Um, <laughs> so, so really, the lectures have to be online if we're going to maintain social distancing. Uh, we are offering um, a face to face small group teaching, so uh, practical certainly have to be on site. So laboratory based uh, subjects, uh, medicine, dentistry, all of them have practical components. They have to be on site for those elements of it. But in addition, all other courses, there will be some face to face teaching. And um, we're just working out how much we can fit in. We're allowing social distancing. Mm -hmm. And then if you the great question about social distancing is do you have one meter plus or two meters and the uh, you know the evidence says two meters is optimal and one meter plus is suboptimal except for mitigations which may broadly get you in the same place. Uh, but then you have to think about staff confidence, you know, staff worries and concerns about that sort of social distancing. Now, our student population is probably at the lowest risk of 
um, severe coronavirus infection, but that doesn't apply to all of our staff. You know, our staff are older and, you know, you can say everybody over 50 is at higher risk. But there are genuine concerns by staff for, for face-to-face teaching and you have to allay those fears. So it's really about working out what inspires confidence in our staff, but also offers the student that face-to-face and campus experience. Mm-hmm. Um, the other issue is coming on the campus just for those small face-to-face sessions, relatively limited this time, is not a substitute for a campus experience, full campus experience, because part of being on a campus is the interactions you have with people. Mm-hmm. And we're just going to have to accept that that's going to be um, severely curtailed for until we get the uh, pandemic under control uh, or you know either through vaccination uh, or, or the rates fall low enough for us to sort of uh, which I, I don't think they're going to fall low enough they would have done if they were going to by now uh, other than through a vaccine so I think unless um, until we get a vaccine and and we have a control of it I think the normal campus life will be curtailed but in terms of the measures other uh, other speakers here have already outlined those social distancing, sanitizers, we're fitting. We've already got about a thousand in there. We've got two thousand more to fit <laughs> still. So we're expanding the numbers all the time. All the buildings are marked. What you know, they have one way systems. They have marked entrances and exits uh, and so on. So the standard sort of measures to reduce transmission of COVID-19 are in place and uh, we're staggering arrival of students so they're not all coming at the same time for students arriving from overseas uh, there will be transportation provided from airports and so on so uh, we we are sort of working out a comprehensive package for the students so that they can remain safe on the campus Mm -hmm. large part of that has got to be communications we have to sort of get the communications right to our students it is their behavior off campus that is most likely to be off risk rather than their experience on campus. So it is really about having that sort of partnership with our students so that they understand that they are embedded in our local communities and their uh, behavior will impact not only them but also the people the communities they're embedded in and those communities are naturally worried as well with an influx of young people so yeah we have to sort of address all of that broad spectrum of things quite a lot to be going at with only a couple of weeks to go now in real realistically um the questions have started coming in i'm actually going to jump on one of them that's picked up a a little bit on, on this question and i was going to go to you jennifer if that's okay to look at to to, to to first give this one a go um, and Anonymous asks, what are the largest problems that you face with driving the feeling of belonging for students on a blended learning experience? And what are you uh, and um, what are you looking to the ed tech market to solve? So I think on that, so are you looking at ed tech as a way of potentially trying to help solve some of these issues? Yeah, so I mean, it's a very good question, Chris, and I think it's one that all of the universities here this morning uh, will be tackling. So um, as we've already heard, I think using a blended learning approach is something that we'll all be employing. And there's a lot of work going on in my university around ensuring that students have a very high quality experience and building a sense of belonging. So we have um, staff working with student groups, so through our students' union, uh, to ensure that we put in place the right kinds of experiences for students when they are working online as well as on campus. So just as for the University of Manchester, we will also be having students coming onto campus. So it's providing um, through small group experiences, building that sense of belonging in their small group, but then also building that out to being part of the university as a whole. And the digital technology, I think, is very much embedded in everything we do now. So I don't think we could function as institutions without the use 
of some kind of educational technology. We all provide our students with virtual learning environments. That is a platform on which they can access a lot of their learning materials. Um, we're also um, spending a lot of time training our staff to ensure that they are equipped to be able to deliver the learning experience to students using these digital platforms and technologies. So it's not a small challenge, but I think it's one that we've, we've actually been tackling for some years now. So even without COVID-19, um, we've all been moving much more towards using digital technologies to facilitate teaching and enhance the experience for students. So it's not as though we're having to pick this up from the get go. I think we're reasonably advanced with it. But the challenge that COVID has presented us is that we've had to probably engage with it to a greater degree than perhaps we had anticipated at this stage in our evolution in terms of uh, the use of digital technologies. Um, so I think, you know, as I said, I think every university will be using these. We might be doing it slightly differently depending on our particular circumstances and the types of courses. You know, it'll be different for a medical student um, for, than it is for a history student, for example. So we're having to tailor the experience to each of our students. I hope that helps to answer the question, Chris. That Definitely. Thank, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Craig, what have you looked at in regards to this? Yeah, we, we are. Um, it's interesting because, as, as Chris said, we, we, uh, we're a startup institution. So before we even launched University Academy 92, we had to think about, you know, if you're going to make a university of the future, uh, you have to think about the technology. So one of our partners, one of our very strong employer partners is Microsoft. And so we built our um, educational digital learning environment on, on the basis of Microsoft Teams, the, the environment we're using here, working very closely with, uh, with Microsoft. Uh, now we work in small groups anyway, so it's a different context to uh, large groups of medical students. So our group size maxes out at about 30 anyway. So we work in small groups anyway. Of course, with social distancing, 30 is a large group in a room that's designed for 30, so that has to collapse right down. So we need even smaller groups in this context. Uh, but we always made Microsoft Teams ubiquitous as our communication tool for staff, for students, uh, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and all our learning resources go on Microsoft Teams. All our uh, uh, texts, rather than having online, uh, rather than having physical books, which actually physical books in terms of transmission issues, universities have to think really carefully about issuing books and what they do with that. Uh, we don't use physical books, everything's online. But I think the positive for me was the transition to full lockdown because the UA92 model is it, students, are, it's very much an engaging, interactive, small group model anyway. Uh, uh, students coming in for four hours a day every day, apart from Wednesday, which is a digital Wednesday, uh, on a fixed timetable. So it's a very intensive timetable where students get a lot of engagement. When we were forced to go into full lockdown, what we did was we just transitioned to Microsoft Teams and it, it wasn't easy, but, but colleagues were already used to my, using Microsoft Teams as part of the blended learning experience anyway. Uh, and so everything just switched online. But what we did was we kept interacting with Teams and using some of the other group uh, uh, meeting facilities so that that timetable could be adhered to, so that students could continue learning and be assessed. And the really interesting thing from our perspective was doing the end of block surveys for the blocks that ended up online, the student satisfaction levels were really high. Uh, now, it doesn't mitigate from that, that social element, so we've had to work quite hard as well to keep people together socially online, be it, be it online uh, uh, physical health sessions and all, 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 all the other stuff. But actually, I think this gave us a real glimmer of hope that actually the students, who are, many of which are digital natives and, and, and those that weren't, we've put support in to make sure uh, uh, that, that they can use the systems, actually transitioned for a period of time to fully online when, there were, when they were used to an interactive experience. So as we start back on campus in a more socially distanced way, they'll be aspects physically on campus but for me if we have to go into full lockdown and there'll be aspects uh, that are blended 
if perish the thought the second wave caused us to do the same again we will continue with the same timetable continuing to use the technology continuing to engage the students so i think the ed tech sector and the digital tech it gives us as a sector a resilience and i think many universities have really upped their game in this respect just because they've they've had to so i think i think technology actually is really key, key to our sector yeah, no, I completely agree. And actually, just picking up on that point that Jennifer made before that as well, um, and the saying that you've made, Craig, is that people have had to adapt to the situations that we're in. I mean, I don't think I ever used Microsoft Teams before the pandemic started. And now we're on here doing a live broadcast using Microsoft Teams. There isn't a day when I haven't spent half the day on Microsoft Teams, whether it's talking to colleagues around the country or having one to ones with people. So I think it's it is the nature of the pandemic that people have adapted and we've learned new skills and how to do it. So why that can't why that can't the same can be used at universities as is in offices across Manchester is, is I don't understand it, to be honest. I think everyone can can manage it in some way. And there's the, the old adage that younger people are always far more adept at technology than the older generations. So if anything, the, the, this generation who's going to be going through university using this blended way of learning are going to come out far more skilled, possibly, than those who are currently in, in the sector at the moment. And um, we've got loads of questions flying in. So um, please, anyone up from the panel, if you want to jump in on any point, please just feel free to. Um, Joe, I was going to just jump to you then, you know, actually about skills um, and thinking about what is it, what are we going to, what what is the importance of working with the private sector, working with the public sector in regards to dealing with skill shortages? Um, there's lots of work that has been done in Greater Manchester um, looking at the industrial strategy, looking at skill shortages across different sectors. Um, I just wanted to, to bring this conversation because I know that um, Condal mentioned it earlier about skills, is what what is the University of Salford doing around managing that issue of skills and looking where we can match up the, the demand and needs to the courses and helping students to get those experiences? Well, I think, I mean, there are, there are two aspects on that. With the, the students, we, we pride ourselves on having very industry engaged curriculum, as, as do our other um, fellow universities. Uh, so as we develop curriculum, we always make sure that there are industry partners involved in, in that development to make sure that we are embedding the latest needs and that we understand what the needs of um, industry is in particular sectors. I think during the pandemic, not, our engagement with industry has not stopped. In fact, it's it's probably upped quite considerably. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things, and I think this might be of particular interest to the audience we have today, one of the things that I think has become apparent um, for SMEs was that they needed to really up their digital game in the same way that we've had to. Yeah, the, the massive move to online and everybody needing to, to interact online has um, has exposed some weaknesses in, in um, all sectors really. And the Greater Manchester Universities have been working together on um, things like the Fast Track Digital Skills Workforce Fund, which was a, a GM um, initiative, which is particularly, it's a, it's a series of um, uh, workshops to help uh, SMEs really upskill in those areas rapidly, um, particularly with response to coronavirus. And we are in, uh, almost daily conversations with the combined authority about right what do we need to do for the regional economy now where are the gaps um, and how can the universities work together to create a, a system that will help everybody from large uh, large industry right down to the the one man band that needs to um, expand doesn't know how um, doesn't necessarily have the skills um, how do we help uh, SMEs to go into automation um, because that's that's a very that's a big jump for SMEs and the pandemic again has exposed the weakness in some supply chains so there are 
um, there are discussions about, right, what do we need to make our um, industry not as reliant on supply chains from the other side of the world? If this is going to happen, then what do they need to do to replace that? And that's a whole set of um, issues that frankly weren't as high up the agenda before the mm -hmm. pandemic. So there's a huge amount of work going on amongst all of the universities about how we offer that to the local economy. Yeah, no, thank you, Joe. Um, we've only got about 10 minutes left. Um, can't believe how quickly time is passing and there's so much more we can talk about. And to be honest, I think I could probably spend an hour with each of you individually just talking about some of these issues. So I'm going to try now and go through some of the questions that we've been getting through from, from the audience. So thank you again, everyone, um, for putting questions. This is your, I would say this is your last call now to submit any questions. If you've got any burning things you want to ask, get it in now or forever. You have to wait for the next time we get everyone together for this. So um, I was going to, Condal, if I can come to you next on this one, um, and I think this is something that probably affects most of our institutions. Um, Anonymous, again, very popular today, um, has asked, how has the pandemic affected the number of international students enrolling in the next academic year? Um, I imagine that all of you to some degree have, have, have seen this in some way or have been affected by it, but if I can come to Condal first, if you just wanted to, to if there's anything from the Bolton side. Yeah, absolutely, Chris. Um, the demand from international students um, for, for Bolton and I guess for many universities is still very strong, mm. uh, especially from markets like India and China. And um, we are trying to do everything we can to welcome those students in September, October this, uh, this semester. Now, of course, uh, we need to be very careful in terms of helping those students um, and the, the, the travel from those countries to Britain, the quarantining, possible learning experience. Um, so in precise, the demand is very strong and uh, in fact it's growing <laughs> uh, in, in, uh, for, for UK universities uh, and uh, I believe um, most of the uh, markets are now opening up in terms of air, air travel between India and China. So hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to welcome all those students. In fact, uh, the Greater Manchester universities, we all came together to help each other and to work together to make sure that we are not duplicating our efforts in terms of whether it's uh, helping the students in air travel, uh, working with the airport, uh, working with airlines, uh, quarantining with NHS trust and number of other things. So in that sense, there's a lot of collegiality uh, when it comes to international students and, and working together. Just if I may, Chris, to pick on the, 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 the skills uh, and to just extend to Joe, there's a couple of questions on that, if I may. Um, one, one thing why we're really uh, interested in the gap areas in the Northwest skill set. So mm -hmm. data analytics, um, automated manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, um, IT development, computer programming. These are the huge, huge skills gap areas. Even in the pandemic and post pandemic, the jobs are there, but the skills are not there. And that's why um, we are gearing up and we have geared up to offer those courses and more places in terms of those areas, both at undergraduate and master's levels. So it's really important. Not only we do the traditional courses like mechanical engineering, um, business management and accountancy and so on, but also to make sure we adapt very quickly to what the industry needs to produce those skill sets. So as Joe said, it's really, really important and we are doing everything we can to launch those courses uh, and we have done so. So just on that. No, thank you, Tom, though. Um, as Anyone else wanted to add about the university, sorry, the international student side at all before I move on to any other questions? Uh, Jennifer. Yeah, yeah, Chris, I would just echo, um, I guess, what Condor said about international students. I think there's been a lot of concern nationally about the impact of um, the lot potential loss of international students for universities in the UK. Uh, and I think we've all been very um, pleasantly surprised that the demand has actually increased. We've all seen application numbers go up from international students. Of course, the the real question is, will they come? Yeah. And uh, as Condor said, we are all doing everything we can to smooth the way for them. But there are some barriers that it has been difficult for us. You know, the travel, the visa centres not being open overseas, 
English language training, a whole range of uh, issues that we've had to deal with as a sector. But I think the sector across the UK has come together, just as the universities in Manchester have, to overcome some of these issues. And uh, I'm not sure how other universities are uh, looking at the moment, but certainly at Manchester Met, um, you know, I think we are hoping to see, you know, hopefully at least 50 to 60 percent of the number of international students that we may have anticipated uh, in a normal year. And, um, you know, it could even be higher, but certainly at the moment it's looking at around about that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Now, Lynn, I saw you nodding quite yeah. encouragingly about international students as well, and particularly yeah. about them attempt that they are going to be able to get here. So. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so I support what Jenny said and our experience is similar. It, it, the question is, are they going to come? And one of the things that is worrying is the rate in Manchester and Manchester lockdown and so on, because the news of this does get out and the students may decide not to come. And the rate in Manchester is increasing it is at a worryingly high level. It is just three cases per 100,000 short of red alert, which, mean, which would mean further lockdown. So there are concerns about our local infection rates and how that might impact students' decision to want to come to Manchester and, and GM generally, because GM rates are all generally going up except for one or two regions. All of them are on the increase, um, I think. So that's an additional complicating factor for us, uh, which which will impact on the number of students we see coming here. Absolutely. Um, we, we're very close to running out of time uh, and we've still got loads of questions to go through. So I'm, I'm really sorry to everyone who's asked, particularly Anonymous, who's really keen on questions today. We've got five or six from Anonymous today. So never mind, I'm really sorry. But um, just to finish up, um, I always like to try and I think we've had a really interesting and positive discussion. I mean, one of the questions was about um, how the institutions are working together in Greater Manchester at the moment. And I think we've heard some examples of that already. And I think it is one of the great benefits that we have of living, working in Greater Manchester is we do have this collaborative approach to working. And it, it's not just in the HE sector, it's in every sector. And I think that's one of the things that people who have come to Greater Manchester from outside this area, when they start working here, they see it as a, a, a fundamental positive of what, of what we do. But I, I'm just going to um, one final question. I'm going to go around everyone. And we always like to finish with a, a bit of a, a, fun, a fun question and a bit of a Mm -hmm. magic ball kind of like opportunity one. So I'm, I'm going to ask each of you um, in turn, imagine that you've become the Secretary of State for Education, not suggesting that that job is coming up anytime soon, by the way, um, that's for other people to decide. But if you've got a magic wand and there's one thing that you could do now to help either the, the HE sector in Greater Manchester or your particular institution, the students who you're working with, the staff, so on, if you had a magic wand, what would be that one thing that you would like to do to see things better improve or just do things a bit differently? Um, I'm going to be cruel on Craig. I'm going to come to you first, if that's OK. So, <laughs> yeah, OK, thanks for, for, for that. Um, I think for me, the one thing I would do in terms of the messaging is is not make it so polarised on this time of year with an A-level bias, with a particular element of society that's that's always been in that traditional university uh, group. I think we all know in the sector now, uh, higher education in all its forms, not just uh, three-year degrees and, and uh, master's programmes, uh, actually can unlock opportunities. And particularly when it's very employer engaged, maybe through degree apprenticeships or through uh, organisations like our own and uh, 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 around this table here that have uh, employer engagement in their delivery. So for me, I think the key message would be one of 
actually it's not just about everybody this time of year thinking about starting in September it's for a wide demographic group a wide age group uh, and there are institutions with multiple entry points we'll be taking students in November as well in January as well uh, and and for me I think the fundamental message would be one about higher education can be transformational uh, for social mobility and for economic development so I think we will get away from that what potentially can be a polarised message about it's all about one thing now. It's a continuing thing and I would hope in many ways uh, actually we should be opening up more opportunities for higher education, particularly here in Greater Manchester for people that could benefit from it, even if it's just a short course uh, for six weeks. That's wonderful. Thanks, Craig. Joe, I'll come to you next. What's your magic wand waving going to do? Uh, my magic wand waving um, would be not to create polarised divides between FE and HE uh, and different parts of the sector, but actually create a coherent system where any type of education is seen as a stepping stone, that is, is a nice continuous flow, um, and that one area of education is not seen as better or different from another, it's all just a continuum. Yeah, wonderful. Condal, I'll come to you. What's the magic wand going to achieve in Bolton? Um, I think one thing for me, um, the universities exist to produce skills for economy. Now, one thing for me is the government to have a roadmap, a, a very quick plan for the skills and resources, produce resources, provide resources for the universities to develop the skills for new economy. The reason I say that it's a broad area, but the reason I said is we are now firefighting. The government is firefighting. Instead of firefighting, what we need is a roadmap, a plan with proper resources for the new economy, because people with millions of jobless people require that direction in terms of developing skill set. And the universities are best geared to act as a tool for the government to achieve that, because universities are the best places to produce the new skill set. So my message or my magic wand is I would stop firefighting and develop a roadmap and use the universities as a tool to, to, to turn the economy around and actually change into the new world so that you know Britain prospers again in the post-pandemic world. Wonderful. Thank you, Kandal. Nalin, what would you suggest? If I can just steal what Kandal said, basically that it is, <laughs> it is, it, it is about recognizing that the only way to recovery and a post-COVID world is through education and innovation. Mm -hmm. But what is required then is to fund the higher education, the further education sectors properly. Currently, we are having to subsidize our research, we're having to subsidize the students and so on. And there is a dependency that's created on overseas students and so on because of that. But if there was proper funding of the higher and further education sector in the UK, we could have a much stronger sector, uh, much more coordinated uh, expansion of it, and uh, we could deliver a, a better product, as it were, in terms of uh, uh, having a better workforce and and uh, and, and can contribute significantly to the post-COVID world. You know, and, and Jennifer, you you started us off today, so I'll come to you for last comments and what your magic wand is going to achieve. Well, Chris, I think my magic wand would um, try to cement everything that my colleagues have all said, <laughs> uh, and perhaps my. <laughs> perhaps by achieving some kind of continuity in educational policy uh, in the UK, because I think uh, as a sector, um, we've had an awful lot of change over the last few years. And to just have a steady hand and a clear vision for education, I think would be uh, something really wonderful to behold for this country. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, everyone. I know all of you could have um, added 10 times over some of the discussions we've had then. I'm sorry I've not been able to pull everyone in all, all the time. And, and thank you, everyone, for listening as well for all your brilliant questions as well. We've had some really interesting ones put through. And I think I hope through the discussion some of those were addressed. Um, but do please get in touch um, if there is something specific you'd like us to, to pass on to any of the panellists from today. So um, we've 
we have run out of time and we've actually slightly run over. So I just wanted to say thank you all for joining me today. It's been a brilliant discussion. I've really enjoyed it. I hope maybe we can do this again in a few months time. Maybe we can see where, how things have been going, um, learn a bit more about what you've done, what's been successful, what's worked and, and ultimately as well, um, getting that message across the positivity around Greater Manchester and particularly in the HE sector. Um, I think it's, it's been a wonderful time this morning. So finally, thank you very much everyone for joining. Um, please uh, thank you for Virgin Money for, for sponsoring as always the Knowledge Exchange. Thank you Pro Manchester for helping us put these on and, and thank you everyone for taking part today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Chris. Bye, bye all.